Hello, everyone, and welcome to Real Story Group's webinar, Navigating the CDP Technology Landscape. My name is Tony Byrne. I'm here with my colleague, Apoor Durga. Uh, really excited, Apoor, and everyone else to, to be here with you today. We've been covering this technology for uh, about four years now, and there's been a lot of change in this marketplace and in our conception, I think, of what CDPs do, what CDPs can do. There's been an elongation of the marketplace, also a kind of a deepening and expansion of the marketplace. So really interesting time to be looking at this technology. Um, and so it'll be a pretty rapid paced half hour together. What uh, I'll just let you know that this is being recorded. And also, you, first of all, uh, you'll all get a copy of the deck in the next 24, 48 hours. Those of you who are Real Story Group subscribers, paid subscribers, you'll get access to a recording of the webinar that you can share with your other colleagues. Now, if you have any questions or comments or anything that you want to share um, or ask about, even something maybe you disagree with, feel free to use the question tab in your GoToWebinar control panel. Ask a question at any time during this half hour, and we'll be sure to get to it, if not in the middle of the session, then certainly towards the end. So I wanted to clue you in a little bit about Real Story Group. Um, as we know that as many as half of you are, are new to Real Story Group, I actually founded the firm 21 years ago, and it was because of this kind of joke quadrant that you see on the left. Um, I was working at a systems integration firm, and we used uh, traditional sort of analyst research, and I was really disappointed with it, the, particularly the coverage of who they claimed were in the upper right-hand quadrant, and then I discovered how vendors got into that upper right-hand quadrant, how that sausage was made, and I thought, there needs to be a better way to tell the real story about these technologies, and so I founded what was originally CMS Watch, now Real Story Group, um, to be a different kind of analyst firm that would only work on your side of the table, that is only for customers of this technology, so we never advise vendors, we never consult with them, we're just really focused on you, the most important player in this drama, who is the technology buyer, the technology user. And so when we publish research about these vendors, and that's what we're talking about today, vendor evaluations and CDPs and what's happening in that marketplace, when we publish vendor evaluations, they tend to be much tougher, much heavier hitting, much more detailed and incisive than you'll get anywhere else. So who do we cover? Well, we cover a wide range of marketing technology vendors, so many that about 12 years ago, we started putting them all on a map annually. But we're in the process of updating this map for 2022, but I want to point you today specifically to the orange line, which is the CDP line. And um, you'll see that like many other marketing technology marketplaces, this is a highly fragmented marketplace. Fragmented is analyst speak, for there are a hell of a lot of CDP vendors. And you'll see that the line also goes through the city center where you'll see a lot of major names, including Microsoft, Salesforce, Adobe, Oracle, so on and so forth. Um, like many other uh, uh, technologies, the major vendors often have some of the weakest offerings here, um, but obviously they are uh, have a lot of mind share as well. So there's a lot of there's always been a lot of tension in this market, like every other MarTech market, um, around whether you should go with one sort of the big known player or something that's more best of breed. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but for now, let's just get right into it. Now, the first thing um, I want to talk about is shifting architecture. So I'll kind of set this up and then and then my colleague, Apoor, who's here with us, uh, who does a lot of our CDP research, he's going to uh, uh, sort of take us through uh, some, some examples of that and then also walk us through the CDP marketplace. And I'll jump in and we'll talk about what's the right way to select a CDP. Um, also wanted to point out that my colleague Scott Dill um, has joined us, and many of you who are uh, uh, RSG subscribers already know Scott. So welcome, Scott. We're just moving along here. So, you know, we like to start almost every webinar with a, an argument. <laughs> and this is our argument um, in a kind of an enterprise architecture oriented technology stack. And the argument is that we have many proliferating engagement channels to see at the top, a variety of different really critical interaction delivery environments, which are important, but also very distinct from each other. And then historically, a lot of engagement services, which you see in the first color row in the middle here, historically, uh, we have spent really the last decade sort of bolstering these engagement services, you know, uh, modernizing them, staffing them, 
The problem is that these engagement services then led to silos where you had, in, in our case, customer data stuck in your customer care system, stuck in your outbound marketing platform, stuck in your web content management system, very stuck in your e-commerce platform, and this was not working. And so this gave rise to what we describe as really the dominant model for the 2020s, which is greater abstraction in your stack and a push towards a more composable stack that 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 focuses very heavily on enterprise foundation services. So you have foundation services on the left for content and information management, on the right for decisioning, and then that mini stack in the middle is around data. We have customer data activation, customer data operations, and enterprise data intelligence. And so today, of course, we're focused on this notion of an enterprise tier for um, for customer data. And what does that look like? And what is the role for a CDP? And it, the reason why we share this why, this way is because there are some profound implica implications around scope for a CDP. So let's talk about that. This is kind of a traditional CDP model that, you know, uh, five, six years ago when CDP vendors started arising, that you saw a lot of diagrams like this. Um, which was a fairly expansive role for a traditional CDP, which is that it was the aggregator of all of your data. It did a lot of identity resolution, data cleaning, data enrichment, relationship graphing, segmentation, and pushed that data out to omnichannel, plat omnichannel engagement platforms, advertising platforms, and even supplied a lot of analytics. And so this is a very holistic view of what a CDP can do. It's almost like a customer data ecosystem in a box. And many CDP vendors still sort of promote this. The reality that has emerged is really much more nuanced, um, particularly with larger enterprises, that, you know, there is a, a, a much more complex and, and variegated uh, customer data ecosystem where we really need to divide up customer data management versus customer data activation. Um, that customer data management, which typically will transpire in some sort of data fabric or data mesh and is quite properly into the domain of data ops versus customer data activation, which is the orange column here, um, which is uh, more properly uh, in, in done by uh, marketing and customer experience ops. And so um, this is a more kind of uh, a, a, a separation of concerns a kind of a domain model that's emerging. Again, not for every enterprise. Uh, this is really geared potentially towards larger enterprises. And so the question is, you know, what is the scope, the proper scope of a CDP in this context? And you'll notice here that we're breaking this down into a wider set of services that potentially involve a wider set of customer data-oriented applications like integration spaces, data warehouses, uh, 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 certainly data lakes and, and other kind of data quality management tools and consent and everything else. So there's a, a bigger picture here um, that your customer data platform needs to become a part of. And so this raises some interesting questions. We've seen some, some topics around this happening on different uh, discussion forums where people are talking about this. And one immediate question has come up and I think has been really interesting one to, to watch this year is, you know, should you build or compose a CDP versus buying off the shelf. My colleague Apoor, who's here, wrote an article about this recently. Apoor, talk to us about what the key issues are here. Apoor, I think you're still on mute. There you go. Thanks. Thank you, Tony. Yeah. So, so that question is uh, increasingly being asked, uh, right? So whether to, whether to compose a CDP or buying it off the shelf. So to be fair, uh, Build versus buy in the context of uh, several technology marketplaces is a long running debate. But we see this debate being revisited in context of CDPs now. So traditionally, there are two different approaches or two main approaches uh, for getting any enterprise software functionality, right? So you can either buy an off the shelf package and then customize it to your specific needs, or you can compose or assemble a platform in house specifically for your requirements, sometimes via, via packaged uh, products or uh, components that you can buy off the shelf. Now, both the approaches have valid rationales, obviously, and uh, we have seen this choice emerge in pretty much all the technology marketplaces. 
However, in context of CDPs, the boundaries between build and buy can become fuzzier, right? Or relatively more fuzzy, right? Now, part of the challenge is that um, a package CDP can vary substantially in scope, like like Tony was mentioning just now, right? So we'll talk a bit more about that in next slide. But the key point I want to make is that because the potential scope of CDPs can be vast, it is important to answer what a CDP will do specifically for your enterprise. So, so let's dig a bit deeper in the next slide uh, uh, and talk a bit more about uh, about the scope issue of the of the CDPs. So this uh, this graphic shows our service model for customer data. The model shows different stages in in data lifecycle, regardless of specific technology platform. So your customer data probably goes through all these four stages, or at least these four stages, right? So so starting from left to right, in dark blue color is core data services. So you need to obtain data from different offline and online data sources, first party, second party, third party data sources, and so on. Therefore, you need some mechanism to ingest data, clean that data perform some transformations and aggregations on it and ensure general data quality management. The second box in light blue color is uh, what we call customer data hub. So once the data is collected or ingested from different sources, you need it. To, you need to tie it to different user profiles or unique user profiles, right? So this includes activities such as um, identity resolution and profile unification, you also enrich your profiles with additional data from third party data sources maybe and while doing all that you also want to ensure data governance compliance and things like that the next stage is uh, in orange color uh, this is where you use all this cleaned up aggregated unified unified uh, profile data for your business objective right so for example now that you have profiles for your 360 degree views of your user of customers you can then segment them based on different attributes right so you can slice and dice those profiles you can create uh, audiences or cohorts you can group similar data and, and do all those uh, sort of activation right and then finally in the rightmost box is the uh, is really the last mile where you engage with your customers via via different channels right so e-commerce email website mobile chat and other channels right so you might want to do some personalization there you might want to do some product recommendation and so on now in larger or complex enterprises the first two boxes here or the first two phases are typically part of a broader enterprise data fabric or mesh so the typical enterprise already possesses the data management tooling to handle those so for example they might have data warehouses, data lakes, ETL tools, data ingestion tools, quality management tools, and so on. And they apply those tooling to customer data as well. So enterprise IT and data teams then become important stakeholders in these first two stages. In the later two stages though, you will see considerably higher marketing or customer experience teams involvement. Now in theory, all these four services or all these four stages can be potentially addressed by a CDP and you will often find CDP vendors boasting that they can perform all these stages equally well. In practice though, we see several variations of this model. Rarely do large or complex enterprises deploy a single platform for all these four stages. So for example, the different, uh, this diagram shows different scopes of CDP for company A and B, A, B, C, A, A, B and C. So if you are like company A, you only need the two boxes in blue whereas if you are like a company c you probably need only the right two boxes so it is very important to decide then what a cdp will do for you so let's let's uh, let, let's let's move to the next slide and talk uh, slightly more about that right so there's another interesting hey, point hey, hey of course hey of course we yeah. just before we do that we've got a question from david that david b that um kind of speaks to this, which is he was asking, you know, which which organization you typically see owning the data fabric stack and which you see marketing works typically owning the CDP. And I think the answer to that, David, that we're suggesting here is generally speaking, yes, that IT and data ops generally own what we describe as the enterprise data fabric or mesh and that 
with respect to customer data activation, ideally this is managed by marketing and CX ops. In the real world, these boxes that we have here, which are nice, neat segments, in the, in the real world, it gets a little bit messier than that. Sometimes marketing needs to rely on data ops and for, for activation. Sometimes marketing people may have their own data ops and, and developers um, as part of their org that are doing some of this work. So the real world is messier, but this is kind of an idealized model. So thanks for that question. But Apoor, let's, let's move on then to this emerging okay. path. Yeah, so, 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 so another interesting point around the scope of uh, this customer data that we see emerging is that uh, we increasingly see that in organizations, in addition to marketing, several other groups need this customer data. And so they are building their own customer data hubs, essentially recreating silos that this technology was supposed to remove in the first place. Right, so we see finance teams, we see customer service teams, we see customer care teams uh, and even analytics slash business intelligence teams needing this customer data hub, right? So the problem with creating such a hub with only one of these groups such as marketing group is that the others don't have seamless access to it. So the emerging pattern here is that such a hub is abstracted outside of marketing technology and is part of a broader data fabric, uh, data mesh, data warehouse or, or, or what have you, right? And therefore your marketing as well as other groups are just endpoints for that unified data. Uh, so now this may or may not be best architecture obviously for you, but, but, but we do see this as an emerging trend and it does sort of go against the philosophy of doing it all within a marketing oriented CDP. Right, so going back to our original reference stack here, you can see that uh, potentially there are several services that can be provided by a CDP. So there's the CDP core, which, which we call uh, customer data activation. But there are other services that you may or may not get uh, from, from your CDP, right? So, or you, you may or may not decide to get from your CDP, right? So you can see that uh, CDP can be made to play in areas such as personalization in, in customer data operations, in outbound marketing, in email marketing, and, and so many other things. Right, so you may want your CDP to do personalization or email marketing, or you may not want it to do those and instead use specialized personalization or email marketing tools. So you see the CDPs can be extended both horizontally as well as vertically beyond their core capabilities. So repeating myself, I'll say it again. It becomes very important to scope out what a CDP can do and should do for your specific need before venturing into the CDP marketplace for, for, for selecting the right vendor. So let's look at, uh, look at the marketplace then. Right, so, so, so this, is, this, is, this is how we see the marketplace of CDP vendors and, uh, and their equivalent GOT characters, right? Of course, this is a joke slide. And in real life, CDP vendors aren't really going around uh, killing other CDP vendors. But the point is that uh, while you might have uh, heard stories of CDP vendors from colleagues and friends, it is important to follow a more scientific uh, uh, approach based on design thinking to select your vendors. We'll cover that approach in a bit, uh, but let's look at how we categorize this marketplace. Right, so we've, we've revised our categorization a bit. We used to have two categories, but now we have three categories uh, in this marketplace. So you have the MarTech uh, suite dependent as the first category. These CDP offerings are really from large enterprise uh, uh, software vendors, right? So SAP, Microsoft, Adobe, et cetera. They can either be processing or engagement oriented, but the key thing about them is that they are usually very tightly bound to the rest of their suite rather than serving as an independent layer which we think is an important uh, criteria for, for a CDP. The second category here is uh, what we call processing oriented independents. These are independent standalone CDP vendors that focus more on data management aspects such as ingestion, profile unification, data cleaning, and so on. And finally, we have the engagement oriented independents. These are again independent standalone vendors but these are the vendors that focus more on activation or engagement. So things like segmentation, self-service, uh, self-service segmentation, journey orchestration, personalization, and so on. 
so you notice you will notice that the third box is uh, this pretty crowded right lot of lot of vendors there the main reason is uh, of course that some companies chose to do data oriented task elsewhere as as we have talked about in previous slide there are other reasons too so data management and id resolution for example are really hard problems to crack and so some vendors have literally given up though given up on those things in lieu of depending on partners right so so also the engagement layer is more more front end and sexier and all all that right so given this uh, given this uh, landscape of of of, of vendors uh, let's look at an approach uh, to select the right vendor so over to you tony to take us through how exactly to do that and how to select the right right cdp vendor Great, thanks for for that uh, for that kind of rapid fire tour of different architecture choices and functional choices, and then the marketplace, which is a really interesting different ways of slicing and dicing. And I'll talk some more about that. But first, the right way to select a CDP. Well, I'd start with what's the right way to select any marketing technology. Uh, we wrote a book about that a couple of years ago, which was really applying a couple of decades of experience of uh, taking a more design thinking or agile-ish approach to this, which is a business-focused, team-based approach that's very empirical. And we've used this with uh, multiple subscribers now to help them select CDPs. And it turns out this methodology works quite well. Where it starts really is looking at what are your primary business use case drivers, um, because again, this is a very empirical test-based approach. It turns out that there are um, at least 10 use cases for uh, a CDP. No CDP vendor typically excels at more than two, three, or four of these. In several cases, a CDP vendor won't do it at all, um, and, and, and that's okay. In fact, maybe that's good, because what you want to do is align your focus um, with that of the vendors. By the way, these are the 10 major criteria that we use when we're evaluating CDP vendors in our research that you can subscribe to. Um, there are some here like advanced customer data management and predictive analytics that to Apoor's earlier point really kind of reach back into enterprise data ops and, and, and implies a more expansive scope for, um, for, for CDP. Others are a little bit more forward facing and more customer facing. Because we had a couple questions about this, I want to point out a couple of these. Wolfgang, um, you asked about household and channel and B2B versus B2C. This is indeed a key uh, distinction among CDP vendors as it is in other case, other marketplaces in the MarTech stack. And um, you wanna be very careful about this if you have other first class objects besides customers because every vendor will say they can support it, but very few vendors can actually support it in the way that you might want. And then also we did get a question, Mike, about uh, Mike L from you about possible solution to the cookie-less world. I would say that uh, there's no single solution to the cookie-less world. We put out some research trying to map seven, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, 16 potential solutions against seven potential business objectives. You can follow up with Scott about that. Some really excellent research, I thought. Um, and certainly, focus on first party data and therefore potentially a CDP was one of the solution vectors that you can follow. Certainly we're seeing more and more of our subscribers who have successfully licensed and deployed CDPs employing those in this scenario that you see in the bottom right, which is digital, digital advertising support. Um, and there's a variety of different ways that you could do that. And we can talk more about that later if you're interested. The key thing, though, is to really prioritize these things because you're also not going to be able to tackle all of this at one time, and you want to make sure that you get your value from your CDP sooner rather than later. So going into the selection process, you really want to identify which are the two, three, four of these that are really your top use cases and then align with a vendor that's um, uh, well-matched for those. Um, I'll point out that this is exactly what our Real Quadrant tool does. Those of you who are subscribers will be familiar with this tool. You go and you put in your, um, you know, your key use cases, some other strategic considerations. You weight all of this, and then you get a Real Quadrant as opposed to a Magic Quadrant that tells you what's the right short list or long list for you, and then you can download custom research and compare the vendors head to head in a really interactive way. So. You can kind of try this out for free. I can tell you that the free version is not nearly as rich as you might like um, for the really cool version that gives you all the inside dope, then you do have to pay for a subscription. Okay, so let's, um, let's do some uh, uh, Q 
key takeaways, and then it looks like we'll have a good amount of time for all of the different questions that you've come up with here. So, uh, CDPs are increasingly foundational to omnichannel stacks, but are not ends in themselves. And this is a really interesting point. And I and I think David B, you asked another question around this. You know, is the value of a CDP only realized once the foundational elements of the ecosystem are in place, e.g., enterprise data platform, lake common data layer, MDM, and the org people aligned to operating a CDP? And that's an excellent question. And David, my my short answer would be yes. Um, I I. Uh, 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 that you do really want to get your data house in order before you license a CDP. Unless your vision, which some enterprises have, is that the CDP is fundamentally a packaged customer data ecosystem in a box. And there are some CDP vendors who present themselves that way. And so it becomes essentially your customer data fabric, in which case you buy it and install it. And, and, and for larger enterprises, I think that's going to be uh, an increasingly untenable use case. But you know, you don't want to just buy a CDP and hoping that that's then going to sort of jolt your enterprise to pay better attention to all of the foundational kind of dirty work around customer data management. And so look at CDP as a means and, and part of your broader customer data fabric and not an end in itself. Um, and uh, two, I think we've, we've hit you over the head with that. Three, um, really important to consider scope with respect to, you know, both vertical depth in your data stack, but also adjacent services like personalization and other kinds of decisioning. Do you want that in CDP or not? These are really interesting questions. And when we're working with our subscribers, very often very situational answers to those. Um, and uh, I think Apoor pointed out the model where you avoid unifying customer record in a single department, and this includes marketing, right? You want to unify your customer records at an enterprise level and then deploy that unified record everywhere. Um, we will always tell you to take an agile-oriented selection process that includes adaptive testing, and you can most definitely do this with CDPs. Um, obviously, I'm biased here, but I believe that our research and advisory uh, also will help you make some good decisions here. So um, there's three different ways that you can engage with us. Um, one is you can license uh, any research stream individually a la carte, including our CDP stream. Uh, two is what we call a full stack subscription, where you get access to all of our research as well as advisory time from us around how to think about your stack. And then for those, uh, there's a select group of enterprises who are then invited to join our exclusive private peer group of MarTech leaders that meets every six weeks. We're going to be meeting here in a couple of weeks to share um, uh, MarTech organization models. Really excited about that. Um, we've talked about personalization. We've had two sessions comparing CDP implementation stories. Really interesting stuff there. Um, hope that your organization can join that. So. A bunch of questions have piled up. We'll definitely get to them as we can here. While we're while Apoor and I are looking at those, Scott, you want to just talk about next steps? Absolutely, and thanks everyone for for taking some time out of your day to join us for the webinar. Um, as Tony mentioned, you're welcome to take a look at the research, not just on CDPs, but on all the other uh, areas that we uh, cover within our research. Uh, he also mentioned the Real Quadrant tool, and um, while the, the free version is uh, just kind of a really uh, light overview of it, so what you can do is reach out to us uh, at the email address you see on the screen, and I'd be happy to take you on a behind-the-scenes tour uh, of the subscriber experience. So please let us know about that, and if you have any follow-up questions uh, on the research or any of the offerings that uh, Tony mentioned. Looks like there, uh, there are many questions, Tony, that uh, you and Apoor can yeah. take a look at. So the first, uh, the first question, and of course, some of these are going to go to you, but I'll take the first one from Michael L. Michael, good to see you again. Uh, can you speak more to where this touches BI and reporting? Um, you know, that depends. I think a lot of CDP vendors would argue that they can provide some reporting and business intelligence themselves, and some marketers like this because it allows them to do some of this themselves in theory, but in practice, remember that your CDP is likely to be a subset of your data. And so we tend to see them more as a kind of a parallel to your BI and reporting. And, and ideally they're both getting fed from your customer data hub and you have BI and reporting and analytics, including predictive analytics as its own uh, downstream recipient of this data and doing its thing. And then the CDP is doing its thing, its other thing. Um, and sometimes they need to integrate with each other, but we tend to think of them as two separate domains. Uh, Michael, you and some other people pointed out that treasure data was missing from our slide. I think we may have just had it under an old logo, the ARM logo. 
um, a poor treasure data would fall under the process oriented vendors. Yes. Under the process oriented, I think Telium got uh, pasted there twice, Tony. Okay. Uh, Sorry about that. Thank you for catching up. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, here's one for you, Apoor, from James M. How would you describe the difference between these two use cases, online personalization and, e and experience optimization? and e-commerce recommendations and optimization. Are those two different colored birds or are they different animals? Yeah, so so James, the way we differentiate between them is that uh, the first one, which is online personalization and experience optimization is more, more website oriented, right? So website personalization, um, different offers on the website, branding, you know, different, different, different ways of personalizing on the website. Whereas the second is more specific to e-commerce, so recommending the right products to your your, your audience, doing things like uh, shopping cart abandonment, for example, right? So, so there is an element of uh, recommendations in both, but uh, but the objectives are really different. One is targeted at uh, at e-commerce or selling, the other is more like experience in terms of what you read or what you consume on the website. So, so subtle differences, uh, some commonalities, but but we do see that uh, as a different focus for different products. Great, thanks, Apoor. Uh, Mike L has another question. Today we have 5,000 enterprise companies and 23 million SMBs. Are there CDPs aimed towards the 23 million SMB companies? So. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly whether you mean you have that many records in your database or uh, are there CDPs aimed towards uh, SMBs um, in, in, there is a lower end of the marketplace. We do cover some lower end uh, vendors. Um, you know, I would say that you have to be at a certain level of scale and sophistication and resources to be able to manage a CDP. It requires care and feeding. It doesn't run itself. And so, there has to be a business case there. We've definitely seen smaller media companies and smaller e-commerce companies use CDPs um, because their use cases were so intense and the value was so high. Um, so if that was your reference, hey, are there CDP vendors targeting the SMB marketplace? I think the answer would be, yeah, there's some targeting the MB marketplace. And we cover some of those in our research. If you mean that you have 23 million records in your database, that's not a huge number. Um, there's definitely, if that's what you're trying to support, is that you have a record of 23 million uh, SMB customers and you want a CDP to be able to handle that. Uh, almost, you know, most CDP platforms should be able to do that. So we've got time for one last question here um, to, from James. Um, let's see here. Uh, what are some of the common considerations and trade offs? between using a marketing automation platform or ESP, like Braze, Iterable, um, as your CDP. So Apoor, why not, if we went back to that architecture, why not use an outbound marketing platform, whether it's a B2B map or a B2C ESP, why not use that as our CDP? Well, sure, and a lot of people do that, right? But uh, but the thing is that you are you are then, Binding your CDP to a specific channel, right? So in this case, if it's let's say an MAP and or a marketing automation platform, then your CDP is too tightly coupled with the marketing automation platform. And if you wanted to do something more omni-channel in nature, let's say using the same data to personalize your website, you wouldn't be able to do that, right? So I think the biggest reason for not using a CDP as part of a channel is that you want to be more omni-channel in nature. Yeah, that's a great pithy answer to something uh, that's a very complicated question. So thanks for that, Apoor. Thanks for joining us as well, Scott. Uh, our time has run out, but wonderful to see you all. Back our website to find out uh, future webinars. In the meantime, you can always download samples of our research. So for my colleagues, Scott and Apoor, this is Tony Byrne signing off for now. Bye now. Thank you. Thanks, Ed.